Hello there. Thanks for stopping by. Welcome to Messing About with an Arrowboat. And another episode of continued subfloor work. But on a positive note, we're almost finished. And the sun's shining, which makes things a bit easier when you're bored, silly, vanishing and laying foil insulation. In this episode, we're down at the stern end of the subfloor, so it's time to think about bilge access uh, and bilge pumps and water drainage. So today I got the last part of the subfloor down and the foil lining, uh, it's taken me a while, uh, you didn't need to see that, but just for the record, it's another day of doing that. It's time to get the very stern end of the subfloor up and we'll get that processed. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, same old, same old. Oh. Some bits of wood and some screws. They'll come in handy. So let's talk about the bilge for a second. It's at the stern end of the boat and if there's any water in the main cabin, that's where it's going to end up. Because there are drainage holes the whole length of the boat, either side of the boat. And the boat sits in the water at an angle because the engine's here, it's heavy, you know, and it makes the water run down. The prop is, uh, is under the water, the rudder's under the water. So the boat generally sits at a, a, a stern heavy angle. So the, any water runs down the back of the boat and ends up in here. Now that there is a steel bulkhead. So the engine compartment is separated from the cabin. So all the water, if there's any water, is just going to sit there. So we have to think about how do we get the water out. So in this corner here is going to be the hot water tank, the calorifier. There's a risk that it could burst. It's not unheard of, it has been known to happen. And any water that comes out of that, in theory, would just end up in there. The water tank is at the far end of the boat. I've switched the lights off because the flickering when I was trying to video this. So any water from a water tank leak would end up down in the bilge too. So what do we do about it? Well, the obvious answer is to put a bilge pump like that. If there's any water in there, it will pump it out. <laughs> In theory. So where do you pump it to? Well I've seen some narrow boaters uh, pump it into their engine bay. Uh, that is a stupendously bad idea in my book for a couple of reasons. One is you then have to cut a hole through uh, your bulkhead but if you're pumping, if there's enough water to make a bilge pump work and, and you, you know it's going to be a fair depth of water to make that work then you're going to pump that water from probably some kind of leak into your engine bay so your engine bay bilge pump then has to kick in and do its job and pump out the water so you have to kind of figure out is the amount of water that I'm pumping out of my bilge pump 
in the cabin bilge uh, is the engine bilge pump heavier duty and faster than the than the one in the cabin bilge so you know pumping water if if this one's pumping faster than this one uh, guess what's going to happen it's going to fill up so pumping any water into your engine bay is in my view illogical it's easier to make a skin fitting and pump it out over the side however if you look at a lot of the boat builders none of the boat builders put in a cabin bilge pump and there's probably a few reasons for that so uh, one is risk what is the risk of a leak so the risk exists but in reality it's pretty low it's not unheard of but it is a fairly low risk and if you've got a leak uh, you'll kind of know about it because your water pump will be running all the time because it's trying to it's trying to balance itself out unless of course there's a leak in the tank before it gets to the water pump yeah the other reason is that pumps or the pump motors and impellers need to work to keep healthy so there's a risk that if you don't run the pump uh, and run it wet periodically, the chances of the motor or the impeller seizing is quite high. You know, a dormant motor is going to be a dormant motor. It's going to seize. So you have to keep, keep putting water in your bilge uh, every so often to make the pump fresh and working and make sure it's cool. So let's say you put a bilge pump in there and you don't do that and you get a leak and there's a bunch of water in there. The bilge pump, it's not going to help. It's not going to work. So you're buggered anyway. So I'm in kind of two minds of whether or not to put a bilge pump in. So a lot of the amateur builders do it and my gut feel is to do it, but None of the boat builders do it. I had a, a chat with the guys in the yard here and they said, why? Uh, because your pump probably won't work. So maybe the better option is to put in a, a moisture meter. You know, one of those little piezo alarms that if it gets wet, it'll, it'll make a very loud noise and they're only a few pounds. But that might be a better option. It doesn't quite answer the question of what do you do if you do have water in the bilge? Uh, it depends on the flow, I guess. You could, you could have a little water pump on standby, uh, like an electric drill. You know, you can get little water pumps on your electric drill. They're okay. Uh, but at least if you know the alarm goes off, you've got a problem, you need to deal with it pretty quick. So let, let me know in the comments, if you've done this on your boat or you're thinking about doing it on your boat, uh, let me know what you did, because it is a 50-50 split. Uh, bilge pump or no bilge pump, uh, and water alarm, or both, I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting to know. Uh, give me your comments, give me your feedback, appreciate it. So the primary reason for lifting up that part of stuff floor is just like all the other bits. Let's get it varnished, let's get it uh, insulated. Um, I'm going to lift some of the bricks. I'm going to make an inspection hatch so that, uh, you know, if we need to access that part and check for water, lift up a lid. Much the same as I did with the floor lockers. Not as big, but let's get uh, an access panel in there um, under the stairs so it's tucked in out the way. So that's gonna be the job. Well, that's the floor uh, inspection hatch, complete at 400 millimeter centers. That yeah, just is a number, really. But the steps are going on that, so I've, I've added that extra bracing for the steps to sit on, just so that the floors don't bounce. And surprisingly, it didn't take very long. I think I've gained confidence from doing the 
uh, floor lockers that just putting in the battens and, and making another hole. Uh, I kind of knew what to do, but then it was, it was uh, fairly straightforward. So what's next? Oh yeah, sanding and varnishing. Uh, all right, well, let's crack on with that. Although I might leave it there for today because I've just realized I've run out of coffee. Oh no. All right, just don't panic here. Don't panic. Everybody panic! <laughs>
old tank top. I just need to now join it all together and square it off and do all the usual tidying up bits. It's a bit saggy in places, so as I go around, I'll straighten it up. That's the port side done, all foiled up and oven ready. Um, I've run out of foil tape, so I need to go to the shop and get some. Uh, there's only two meters left to do, six foot left to do on this side. Uh, yeah, I didn't really film it because yeah, things are boring enough already. Oh, another day, it's turned cold again. It's pretty cold, it's about 10 degrees Celsius. It's uh, very, very windy, blowing a hoolie. Let's just crack on and get what we can done today. It's about a 40 knot wind. I guess that means I can't take the boat out then. <laughs> That's not all done. I'm going to tack it up now. I've had lots of knee breaks along the way. Not tea breaks, knee breaks. Giving my knees a bit of a rest because that's quite sore. But tack it up now and then we'll be done. Yay! That's a subfloor all done, foiled up. All ready to be baked. Nah, I'm only kidding. That's all the foil on. Um, I've got a wee bit to do. So the very, very last bit is just waiting for the final coat of varnish to dry. Um, but I think I've noticed when I've been working in here, there's a couple of bits of exposed steel. So I'm going to put some primer on it uh, just to protect that steel. I'm a bit paranoid about steel protection. And similarly, the door frame, um, while it was sort of primed, it's not a great job and it's all covered in spray foam. I think I'll sand it back and give it a coat of primer um, just to protect it. You know, I, um, I think a bit over paranoid about protecting the steel. Uh, so I'm going to do that. But first it's coffee time and I brought two flasks of coffee with me this time. I cannot risk running out of coffee. Uh, I'm far too addicted. <laughs> coffee break. It's wind. People that know me know I drink far, far, far too much coffee. I drink at least 10 cups of really strong coffee a day, at least. I can't get to sleep at night unless I have my cup of coffee. Uh, got to keep my caffeine levels on a panic. <laughs> so this this uh, foil, I've been thinking about it, the foil lining. Um, there's been some positive comments, some not negative, but you know, pointing pointing things out, comments, and and I, I get it, I completely get it. Um, the arguments are that. It's below the water line. It probably won't make much difference uh, in terms of insulation wise. And I, I kind of understand that. I'm sure there's some kind of theoretical calculation that shows that it's, it's kind of a little bit warmer. And that's my gut feel. It's a little bit warmer. I think my stronger feel is the creation of a vapor barrier. So, um, if we didn't put this down, there would be some airflow uh, on the base plate 
which reduces the condensation. Everybody knows you need air to reduce condensation. Uh, so there's some airflow, but you know, there are gaps in the floorboards because you want the wood to expand and contract. And so not necessarily getting that air flowing front to back or back to front. It's not going to get all the way there. I think my theory is that if you put the foil in and you create a good vapour barrier, I'm not talking about creating a vacuum, that's just not possible, um, but creating a good vapour barrier helps that air further down the boat from the, from the bow where I'm going to duct air vents. Uh, and again, I look, at, I look back at what boat builders are doing, so, uh, and other DIYers, some do it, some don't. Uh, boat builders, some do, some don't. And when I talked to Pete at the Soar Valley Steel Boats, he said it's pretty common now to put it in. So I thought, why not? It is a pain in the neck though. I mean, it's taken me best part of three weeks. Uh, elapsed, not, not working days. But, you know, it's uh, to get me back to where I started. <laughs> It's taken a wee while. I don't think I'm going to put the foil above the gunnels on the walls or in fact on the roof. No, I was going to put it on the roof, the ceiling. Um, but I'm not so sure. I think it's a bit of a pain. Uh, I think once I get it up, I'll have to cut quite a lot of it for mushroom vents, for cable runs, for lights. Um, and to maintain that, kind of vapour barrier it would mean every time I cut a hole in the, the uh, lining for the ceiling uh, I'd have to cut a hole in the foil because you don't want the foil touching any of the electrics uh, and then I'd have to tape that to, to maintain that vapour barrier so I'm not so sure it's got any major value on the ceiling other than an extra bit of insulation, which isn't a bad thing. So I'm, I'm 50-50 again. Let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, I'd be kind of keen to hear. Uh, I know that most of the eyewires foil line the whole boat. Um, and again, I've had people saying, why? I've got spray foam. The spray foam is, is mega. It's the best insulation you can get. So why add any more so yeah let me know in the comments thanks and while we've been chatting i'm on my third coffee <laughs> oh god i really need to, i need to let some blood back into my caffeine stream <laughs> yeah. almost finished this one fireside chat over back to work uh well it's not really a fireside but it's where the fire will be so right Next job, you can see there's a wee bit of overspray on spray foam and not the best where they've done. I mean, they've got, they've got that bit primed, but I must have forgot this bit. So I'm just going to do that now. Phosphate primer, direct to steel. Uh, you can't buy small tins of this stuff, unfortunately. Wish I could. These are my favourite little half-inch brushes. I use them all the time. Used them when I was building model railways. Uh, used them for painting the gunnels and stuff like that. Um, they're dead cheap and they throw away, and you buy them in packs of like twenty. So they're ideal for this sort of thing because. You can't really clean these brushes, and if you use an expensive, uh, an expensive brush, it's kind of pointless. So these are, these are quite nice. You get them on Amazon and other places, I guess. But little disposable half-inch brushes, um, yeah, brilliant wee things. As an end-of-day present, with the winds, now we've got snow and slush and a downpour. Oh. Oh well, glad it's nice and toasty inside with all this insulation.
So I think I'm going to wrap up this week's episode there with a very, very symbolic putting the lid on the varnish for the very last time. Yay! So, thanks for watching. Thanks for all your comments, they're brilliant. Uh, I really do enjoy the interactivity uh, that we have. Uh, thanks for liking, you know, click that little bell icon uh, and you'll get reminded every time we have a new episode. Uh, so thanks for subscribing and we'll see you next time.